Hello, everybody. Welcome to Classroom 2.0 Live. Thank you all for coming, spending some time on Saturday, September 28th with us. Uh, I am Lori Moffitt, and I do have my mic on this time. I did not last week when I started. And I'm one of the co-hosts for today's show, along with Peggy George and Tammy Moore. Uh, Tammy is the one that does the closed captioning for everybody. If English is not your first language and you rather read what is being set, said, you can click on the closed captioning icon and um, watch the words go by as well as listen to them. Um, today we have Zoe Midler, who's our featured teacher. And before I introduce her, there are some some questions I'm going to ask. Let's go to some slides first. Um, all of the links that Zoe is going to be sharing with us are in the Classroom 2.0 Live Binder. And um, Peggy's actually going to be dropping links in the chat. I will be capturing questions that you may have in the chat. There's the Live Binder link that has all of the uh, various pages in the right-hand column rather than across the top of the live binder. All of the sessions are recorded and they are posted at this particular link in the archives and resources page for Classroom 2.0 Live. And there are various types of recordings you can find there. Uh, here is where you're going to be doing a little interacting with us. Uh, we always like to find out where you are in the world. That, that is where you're logging in from. I'm in central Pennsylvania, about right there. Um, and what you do is you click on that starburst, the second icon down in the tools, and then place it on the map. If it doesn't go exactly where you want, that's fine. Uh, you can always move it, but you've got to click on that icon on the map to show us where you are. If you'd rather type your location in the chat, you can do that as well. Double click on the map. There we go. Now we're seeing all sorts of United States and we have South America people. Usually we've got uh, Eastern Hemisphere as well. That's always fun, finding out where we are. Here's our first poll question of today. And it's a yes or no question. So on that little check mark near your name at the top, that's where you're going to be answering. Or you can type in the chat. Do you currently use Google applications for education? So it's a yes or no question. So I'll give you a chance to vote. It's the icon with the check mark if you're having trouble finding the icon. So it looks like we're about half and half from those that voted. We've got 25% no and 29% yes of those in the room are using Google applications for education. The next poll question, do you re routinely co-plan and co-teach lessons with your colleagues or members of your teaching team? Again, it's a yes or no question. And I'll publish these to the whiteboard. And it looks like 36% in the room do not co-plan or co-teach. So you may be very interested in those resources today. 
And we do have another poll question, poll question three. And I'm going to change the choices so that you can answer this one. As a teacher librarian, are you seen as a story time person or teaching partner? A, story time person, B, teaching partner, C, other. And if it is C, please type what that other is in the chat. And if you're not a teacher librarian, you can answer from a teacher perspective. So I'll publish these tools as well. And again, of those that voted, most are B, teaching partners. And there are a few others. All right. Our, today for Classroom 2.0 Live, our, our guest is Zoe Midler. And she is a teacher librarian at Flagstaff Academy in Longmont, Colorado. She's also a Google certified teacher and is Flagstaff's Google czar. Zoe comes to academia from the corporate world, where she worked in the high tech field as a software product manager, senior product manager, manager, and online marketing strategist working for technical software publishers, including Wolfram Research, the makers of Mathematica and Wolfram Alpha. Excellus, the makers of IDL and NV software and marketing communications firm Leopard Communications. Zoe is not a rocking chair librarian. She's a tireless evangelist for information literacy, contextually relevant collaboration, and, and embedded librarianship. She fosters an atmosphere in the library media center that encourages students to investigate and scrutinize all aspects of the information environment and become discerning consumers of information. And I do have a newbie question for Zoe. What does Web 2.0 mean to you, and why do you use Web 2.0 tools in your classroom? What comes to your mind when you hear the word collaboration? So I'll turn the mic over to Zoe. Hi, everybody. I hope everybody can hear me OK. Um, I'm actually going to turn my chat window off um, because I think it will be hugely distracting for me. <laughs> and it's going to be hard enough for me to stay on track here with all the information that I want to cover. But, um, so I'm going to start with that. What does 2.0, uh, Web 2.0 mean to me? And I thought a lot about this over the past few years. But really, for me, Web 2.0 tools are really about enhancing and augmenting the learning experience for our students. Um, there are also these ways that we can, tools that we can use to publish our students' work. And I think that's incredibly important, uh, publishing student work and empowering their voice and allowing them the greatest flexibility and demonstrating mastery of a topic. Um, I think those are, the, those are the real benefits of Web 2.0 tools. And when I use them in the classroom, primarily I am using Google Apps for education tools, but I use a wide variety of tools that you'll see today when I bring up some of the examples. Um, for collaboration, uh, collaboration is kind of tricky, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that uh, during the course of the presentation. But really, collaboration for me is about bringing a lots of subject matter experts together to share their expertise and create something uh, maybe new or different or enhanced. And it's really a consensus of these subject matter experts that come together uh, to create a really interesting final product. In, in the corporate world, we call these deliverables. So um, my collaboration is, uh, focus is always around finding a way to create like, the best possible deliverable we can for our students. OK, I think I have control now of everything, right? <laughs> All right, so I want to talk about the objectives for today a little bit. Um, actually, I want to back up just a minute. I want to talk a little bit about how somebody from the corporate world got involved in academia. And uh, I just want to let everybody know that the, the way that I came to this was um, from frustration, watching my own kids um, you know, going to school at the time. They were middle school students and high school students. And, I was watching them come home and talk to me about how they were conducting research at school. And 
it was really obvious to me that um, there was a missing piece to what they were learning about research. It just really wasn't happening the way that I thought it should be happening. Uh, I have a lot of research experience, and um, I saw research for them actually meant, um, you know, getting an assignment from a teacher and coming home, going to the internet, going to Google primarily, and typing whole questions into Google and copying and pasting answers into whatever they were working on, and that was very frustrating for me. So I decided that you know, maybe I could take my 20 years of information and research expertise, um, get a degree, and maybe become a librarian, because I felt that librarians were probably best positioned to help with those aspects of, of research and research strategy. So uh, I've been at Flagstaff Academy since 2008. And I was a really a, a, the leading evangelist at the time there for bringing um, Google Apps for Education into our school and making Flagstaff a Google Apps uh, for Education um, uh, facility. Uh, I went on to um, become Google certified. And Google certification is a, a series of exams that you can take that will let you um, uh, pass, pass these exams and get this what they call individual qualified status. So there's six of these exams that you can take. And I did that, and then after that I decided what could I do next. Um, so last, uh, this past summer I applied for Google Teacher Academy and I was accepted and went to Chicago in July and became a, a Google certified teacher. And that was an amazing experience. If you ever get a chance to um, apply, if it's happening you know, locally or if you want to fly to you know, some exotic place next time they do it, definitely apply and, and try to get there because it's a wonderful personal learning network opportunity for, for you. Um, I'm also uh, the school's Google czar, and, and really what that means is that um, there's somebody sort of keeping their finger on the pulse of the changes and things that are happening at, uh, at Google. Google is a rapid iteration company. For those of you who use Google tools, you know that sometimes you can't get attached to too many cool features and, and cool things because sometimes they change them on you, so someone sort of needs to keep up to date with that. And I'm extremely lucky that I get to work with three other teachers at my school who are also Google Individual Qualified, and together we make up what we call the GAPS Specialist, Google Apps Specialist Team. And we oversee all of the staff training for Google applications for education as well as parent training. And um, I'm looking at my list of people who are out here in the main room today, and I see a few of my Google Apps Specialists out there, so hello to all of you guys. So having said all of that, that's how I got into the education field. And um, the objectives for today's talk are really, I want to talk about the key characteristics for embedded librarianship. And, and this is sort of a changing uh, topic or field, so this is my snapshot of the moment. I want to demonstrate for you you know, some real world examples of how I use Google Docs to serve as a way for me to embed my expertise in the learning process, um, you know, both at the point of need and sort of upstream in the process. And I want to outline some of the steps I've taken um, that you could possibly use to become um, more embedded. And, and it's not just teacher librarians. I mean, I think uh, teachers in general can use some of these tips to figure out how to work more closely with your teams and, and embed yourself in, in the whole um, lesson planning process. So when I came into the profession, I had a real specific brand in mind that I wanted to create. I thought, um, how, how was I successful in the corporate world, and could I make that um, something I could apply in the academic world? So the brand that um, I used a lot in the corporate world was, you know, I really connected with my colleagues. I wanted to collaborate with them so that we can create really great things. And all of those tactics that, you know, you use building the trust and understanding who has the subject matter expertise within your organization, um, all those things I thought I could, I could bring to bear um, on this idea of sort of building uh, products with, with my colleagues at schools, products meaning like sort of lesson plans and final deliverables for students. And, and that was a really great idea, um, but when I actually got to try to do this, <laughs> I had a lot, of, a lot of hurdles to overcome. Um, when I first started, I had 825 students. It was just me in the library. There was no aid. Uh, I had no computers when I first started. Um, I was on a fixed scheduling basis, which just means that students came to me on a very fixed time frame. You know, um, teacher Smith always came to me on Mondays for a half hour, and that's all the time that I ever got with them. Uh, I was seen as a specials person, one of the specials teachers. Uh, that means, again, I was on a very rigid and fixed scheduling system. 
there was no real culture of collaboration at our school. There wasn't a lot of um, what I would call true collaboration. Definitely some cooperation, but I'm not sure about collaboration. Uh, teachers viewed the library as a place to park students so they could have planning time. That's very much what happens. Um, uh, uh, very much what happens when you're considered a specialist teacher. I was definitely seen as the story time lady or the circulation desk person. And we also had a less than proficient level of books in our library to support our student population, which just means we didn't have any books. And they were in pretty bad shape. We had a lot of uh, books that had been donated. And so there wasn't a lot of, uh, people just didn't see the library as any kind of um, hub for the school really in any way. So uh, I have to also say too, I wasn't getting a whole lot of support from administration when I first started. Um, because they really didn't understand the kind of things that I wanted to do, where I wanted to go to a more flexibly scheduled space, and I wanted to work with teachers to co-plan and co-teach lessons. And, and this was a real paradigm shift for administration, and I think also for the teachers. So I knew I had a lot of work ahead of me. <laughs> so um, I think the other thing I have to say, too, is I'm not sure if this is true for all of us out there, but I know that when I came into the profession, uh, coming out of a library program, I was learning about being a 21st century librarian, the way that libraries are changing and evolving, but I found that the teachers coming out of their teaching programs were not getting the same messaging. They were still being taught what they've been taught 20 or 30 years ago about how libraries operate. You know, it is a place to get stories read to your students, um, maybe do a couple of lessons on Dewey, and um, this is a place you'll put your students for planning time. So there was a real, there was a real conflict there in, in these in concepts about how this space should work. So I, I definitely had a lot of work ahead of me, um, and I needed to figure out how I was going to make this brand, you know, come into to existence. So one of the key things that happened for me along the way was um, I was really fortunate to do um, some um, internship time with a librarian close to me here in Colorado, down in um, Jefferson County, Colorado, and her name is Tammy Langberg, and she is um, the librarian at Semper Elementary, and I got to spend about 80 hours with her and, and her principal, and they were running an amazing library. Uh, it was totally flexibly scheduled. It was doing all those things that I wanted to do. She was definitely co-teaching and, and collaborating with the teachers. And she was really seen as an information environment expert and research expert. So one of the things that they taught me is they said, look, though, what you have to remember is that collaboration doesn't look the same for everybody. And if you go into this thinking collaboration looks the same way for everybody, it's going to be a really hard slog for you. So keep that in mind that you might have to start out with um, maybe cooperating first and then moving to collaboration. So there really is a fine line. You know, teachers weren't waiting for me outside the door of the library the day I started. Hey, so let's get together and collaborate and do some really cool things. You know, that wasn't happening. So I had to kind of take a step back and be okay with the fact that I was going to have to be um, willing to do the cooperation and the collaboration if that meant that's how I was going to build trust with teachers and demonstrate the value that I could provide to them. Uh, about the same time, I encountered this idea of embedded librarianship that was sort of percolating in the world. And these are my PLN, my personal learning network gurus. Um, all of these individuals have uh, written about or are involved in some level of embedded librarianship. Um, Mr. Schumacher is the clinical associate professor at the School Library of Information Science at Catholic University of America. Uh, Buffy Hamilton, who I want to say um, big shout out to Buffy because um, she's been a real guru for me and I know she has been for a lot of teacher librarians out there. She um, actually has been the one to encourage me to come and talk about what I'm doing. She did a, a, a ALA tech source magazine sort of um, piece on embedded librarianship and she interviewed me about a year ago and featured me in that write-up that she did and that really was the impetus for me to come out and start talking about what I'm doing. So uh, big shout out to Buffy. Uh, Mike Eisenberg is um, at the uh, uh, University of Washington Information School and a lot of you might know him because he is one of the co-creators of the Big Six um, a problem solving methodology which is something I'm, I'm very um, keen on and I use in our library. And then, of course, there's Tammy uh, Lingenberg, and she is a, a power librarian, and she's, again, at Semper Elementary, um, and also a really great mentor for me. So those goobers were talking about this idea of embedded li library uh, librarianship, and at the same time, um, I was also starting to hear about Google Apps for Education, but 
I was really thinking about, you know, this what is like what is embedded librarianship and how could I use it and could I bring these two things together? So I'm not always really keen on <coughs> putting big uh, slides up with lots of quotes, but I thought this was probably uh, uh, better than me trying to restate it. But basically, um, the thing that I want you to key in on here is that, uh, you know, we're taking a librarian out of a traditional context and we're putting them in situations that allow for coordination uh, and collaboration. So, you know, we're definitely on site, but sometimes we can't always get together. There's always barriers sometimes to us getting together. So I was very keen on this piece of the definition. Um, I'm there, but how do I get close to the teachers? How can I become, um, you know, uh, kind of be there when they want me to be? And then that combined with this piece, I thought was very interesting. Um, I'm in my chat window because I can't see my slide. There we go. Uh, you know, working upstream in the process. So a lot of times, librarians in particular, you know, we get to participate in projects way down the line when the teacher's already developed the lesson and already understands what that deliverable is going to be for the student. But hey, can we bring them in for a few minutes and could you pull some books for us so we could do a little bit of research? And um, that's not upstream in the process, that's way down in the process. And I'd like to be uh, up at the top when teachers are actually putting that lesson idea together so that I can interject my subject matter expertise, um, you know, way up at the top and I can sort of figure out how I can co-teach um, and participate in that project with them at a much sort of deeper level. So those were kind of my guiding quotes when I was thinking about what does it really mean to be an embedded librarian? And for me, those there are three characteristics. You know, you are really proactively delivering information at a point of need. And point of need is really the important piece here because uh, that's when people want you and that's when they need you, when they're in the middle of it and they need that help. Um, collaborate with staff through a variety of communication avenues. I can't wait for teachers to come to my door and maybe get invited to a team meeting. I've got to figure out how I can talk to them through a lot of different avenues. How can I reach them? That's where I want to you know, get that cooperation and that collaboration going. And then I think a really good embedded librarian is going to be up participating upstream. So these are sort of the three big characteristics that have um, kind of influenced me in my work and, and putting together that brand that I'm talking about. And then the missing piece for me was definitely Google Apps for Education. And I started to think about that and I thought, well, maybe I have the platform I need now to, to meet all those requirements for embedded librarianship. So I started to think about this and I wondered how could I test this? How could I, how could I see this brand in action now that I've been now that I have this Google Apps piece, which really for us is a collaboration and productivity platform for our school. So it was kind of like staring me in the face the whole time. <laughs> so I started to think about what could I do? How could I test this? So we have a, a fifth grade team that has a, a thing where students every week have to do an A to Z assignment. And it really is, um, it's, it's, it's literally one letter every week of the alphabet in that the students then have to go off and do some research, really answer finding, frankly, um, on things associated with that letter, so social studies, grammar, history, and science. And it always seemed like a project that was a bit make-worky, but I, I understood the need for it. And I thought, well, can we do something different with this project? You know, how could we make it different? And, and I was really lucky at that time. I had about 15 parent volunteers that helped me in the library. And, every week they would come in and they would complain to me about A to Z and they would tell me how, um, you know, it was, it was really difficult, they could never find the, the, re the answers to the questions, they didn't know where to go to do the research, um, students were always doing it the night before it was due and it was just kind of a hassle for them. And students would sometimes come in and tell me too that they couldn't find the stuff they needed to, you know, get through A, through A to Z, through, you know, get through it quickly and efficiently. And, and some of them just really didn't see any value in this whole, whole process. So that gave me an idea. Maybe this is a project where I could test these ideas out about point of need assistance and being proactive and maybe getting a little more upstream. So what I did is I went to that team lead for fifth grade and I said, you know, um, would you mind sharing with me your A to Z doc? And so all the teachers in fifth grade build these A to Z assignments as a Google doc. And if you're familiar with Google docs, you can actually share documents with other people. So um, Kelly Burnett, who's the team lead for fifth grade, uh, she shared that document with me and I said, I'm going to put tips directly into this document for students. 
so that they can start using our safe searching resources to accomplish um, their A to Z projects. And um, the A to Z, uh, uh, the safe searching resources are really all of those databases we pay for, uh, CultureGrams and PebbleGo and um, KidsInfoBits, all these databases that a lot of schools use that get underutilized because people don't know they're there. So I was thinking I could maybe embed tips directly into A to Z that would get our students using those databases, um, give them point of need assistance, and um, have them working with resources that were a little more credible and authoritative than just doing general Google searches. And this was actually also a covert attempt on my part to introduce our parents to these resources because I knew parents were helping students do these projects. So I was trying to hit, you know, you know kill lots of birds with one stone, so to speak. So I'm going to show you the next slide, which are some samples of what A to Z documents look like. And then I'm actually going to try and take you out here to show you a real A to Z document. But basically, you can see that um, just from the slide that I've got, uh, you know, I've, I've actually branded um, our, we call them LMC tips. And when you see a tip is about to occur, you see the little LMC Library and Media Center icon, and then the tip is below it. And I actually walk students through exactly what to do to find answers to a specific question on any one of our databases. And now I'm going to see if I can share this with you guys. Let's see. Um, Nope, actually, I'm going to be here. I'm going to show you the letter E. Um, I'm in app sharing right now, so I can't see anything um, other than what I have on my browser screen right now, but I'll try and kind of go through this. And this is also, a, a, I believe this might be on the Live Binder or one of my other letters are on the Live Binder, so you can always go look at that. But you can see that what I do is I let the student know when a tip is about to occur. I'm really all about branding the, the library in the space, and then I give them the tip. I tell them where to go on our LMC wiki, which is our portal for all of the databases, and I'll try and show that to you in a second as well. Um, and then sometimes we insert search challenges also into the, the letter of the week. And what we wanted to do is we kind of wanted to sweeten the deal a little bit for students who um, get through these pretty quick, some of our high achievers, and give them an additional challenge, although any student can do this. And if they do the challenge and we see that they've done it correctly, uh, we'll let them earn badges and the badges can be awarded to um, individuals or the whole class if they take on some of the search challenges. So uh, I take a lot of screen caps. Um, I'm walking them through the different steps on how to do something. And um, again, what I'm really trying to do is be there at point of me, sort of virtually sitting next to them, offering them assistance, and also introducing to them to some great resources that we have that we pay a tremendous amount of money for that I want to see used. <laughs> That's what's really important. Um, the LNC Wiki, I'll try and show you that right now too. Uh, so this is sort of um, the candy jar, if you will. And the reason I say candy jar is because uh, everybody, all the students know the candy jar is where all the good stuff is. And we've created this space, um, which is actually a combination of Wiki spaces and Glogster, so um, students can quickly access all of our databases. And I really wanted this to be um, incredibly visual um, for our students uh, so that visual searching was a little easy for them. And then, of course, we've added a lot of things on the side here that are specific to um, just doing research in general. So those were two um, really important resources uh, that combined for A to Z. Now, I'm going to try to get back to where I need to be, and hopefully this will work. Uh, I think that actually worked. Can everybody see the slides again? I just want to make sure that I'm where I need to be. It worked great. Okay, thanks, Peggy. <laughs> so, um, so this was sort of a culmination of a lot of things that I was testing with this A to Z, you know, could I do all these different things? And um, now I felt like A to Z wasn't sort of this um, just sort of make work project. I was accomplishing some goals with it. I was demonstrating to that fifth grade team all the information I could provide. We, we went a couple of steps further here, too, I should say, on A to Z. Uh, we brought all the fifth grade classes through for letters A through D to model how the tips work. 
and show them how to use different features and, and parts of the different databases that we had. So it kind of started out small, but then it definitely grew. And then before you knew it, students were in the LMC with me, with the teachers, co-teaching how to use all the tips and how to talk about, you know, we started talking about how to do research, how to do it effectively. So it was this kind of little organic thing that spread out from the whole A to Z process. Um, so that was, uh, I, I had great hope after that, that, you know, maybe I was going to finally um, start to work with teachers at, at maybe a more of an, an upstream process. So I just want to say the benefits of A to Z were we got those students who's using the databases as part of their research journey, which was huge. We're kind of virtually modeling safe searching techniques um, for our students at the point of need. We were covertly teaching those parents about these resources, which was huge because those parents now love these databases and whenever I need funding for those databases, we're going to make sure we get it. And uh, it's really funny, on Sunday nights I'll be in a letter and I can see all the students who are in a letter at the same time I am because the teachers take these A to Z pages and post them to their websites. So you can see at any given time, if you're one of the people that the documents have shared with, who's in there. And sure enough, on Sunday nights, I'll find five or six students and they're working on their A to Z and I can see them working on it and where exactly how they're accessing, you know, I know which tip they're on and, and that was really gratifying to me. Um, so, like I said, the badges we created to sort of sweeten the deal and here's a little array of some of the uh, badges that we create and um, what I'd like to try and do is show you again what this looks like. Um, yeah, I want to go to application sharing. So the one teacher who is the team lead for fifth grade, she's actually done something really interesting. She has created a page on her website where she puts all the badges. So um, as students earn their badges, and I think it's just so funny, I keep saying badges like that movie, you know, we don't need the stinking badges. But anyway, um, you can see that she actually posts their badges right here and she'll tell you what they earned them for and she'll tell you, you know, accomplished by the entire class. Um, if there were individuals that earned the badge, she'll put it up here. And the kids really dig this and they really like it and it, it was just a way to, like I said, to sort of sweeten the deal for everybody. Um, and the badges we even award to younger grades now because um, we're kind of spreading this kind of idea of badges all around. So I'm going to try and get back again here. Let's see if I can be super fast about this now that I think I kind of know what I'm doing. Um, let's see, there we go. Okay. So those, those are some of the things we did to sweeten up um, that deal a bit. The other thing that we did too is we didn't just want students out there finding a bunch of answers and missing the point of, you know, giving credit where credit is due. So uh, Kelly Burnett again and I, the team lead for fifth grade, put together a citation log because, you know, in most of the databases that you use at the bottom of the page, there'll actually be a, a, a citation in some format, MLA7 or, or whatever it is that you use. And um, uh, what we did was we, I created that little cheat sheet that you kind of see here. It says MLA uh, citation log. And then Kelly created the actual form, the, the spread, uh, the document for students to list their citations in. So all we were asking them to really do is please make sure you put your citation for that particular letter sources on this document and then they can share that with the teachers. And this is how we know if they actually did one of the, safe, uh, one of the search challenges correctly because we would know the citation that was required you, know, you, you couldn't get to that citation unless you did the search correctly. So we started using that. But um, this year, we've actually moved away from uh, using the Google Docs piece for this, and now we're using EasyBib. Um, we just um, uh, subscribed to EasyBib, and we're learning how to put everything into um, projects within EasyBib that can be easily shared with teachers. And uh, the other thing I really like about EasyBib is it's totally integrated with Google Docs. So students log in with their Google accounts into EasyBib and then they can export data from EasyBib into a, a works cited in a Google Docs page. So uh, that's been pretty amazing. And we're just learning about EasyBib. Like I said, we've only had it for a few months, but it's incredibly robust. Uh, I really, really like it. And it's kind of like, again, one-stop shopping when you're doing um, all that citation work. So it helps out a lot. The next thing um, I started thinking about doing was, well, look, if <laughs> If I can collaborate through a doc, um, maybe I can get upstream, which was really a big goal of mine. How do I get 
you know, into the planning process with these teachers so that I can um, not only help them think about how to you know, incorporate certain uh, research standards into these projects, but, you know, how can we even infuse some technology into these projects. And as the school's Googles are and somebody who comes from a tech background, I really wanted to get more technology integrated into our projects in a meaningful and purposeful way, not just to use the latest gimmick, but, you know, like I said, to publish student work, uh, give them opportunities to demonstrate mastery, and, you know, get those macaroni pictures and hallway posters out of the school's hallways and out into the world where everybody can see them, parents and, and maybe other schools and other teachers who might want to use our students' work to teach their students about particular topics. So um, all of these, uh, these um, things that are listed here are collaboration documents that I created. So I got this idea that maybe I could open a doc and I could create a collaboration form where I could go to the teachers and say, um, hey, listen, I know you're going to be studying uh, modern Japan, second grade teachers. I know you're going to do a whole thing on modern Japan. Well, wouldn't this be a great opportunity for us to work together on having the second graders learn how to do some basic research and then figure out a way that we can have them demonstrate mastery by tying into six traits of writing, which is a big thing at our school. So what I actually had to do, and what I do a lot now, is I actually create exemplars for the teachers to look at. So I go out there and I create the final product, and I show it to them, and I get them excited about it, and then they're like, sure, let's sit down and talk. <laughs> so um, the, the collaboration doc that I'm going to show you now is from um, one that I put together with the, the second grade team, and this is the Modern Japan collaboration document. And I'm going to have a million tabs open by the end of the session, so hopefully my computer won't crash. So this is what the collaboration document looks like. Again, I start a document. Uh, it's kind of, it's a little bit formulaic and, uh, um, you know, so that we all kind of do the same thing when we get in here and work together. I'll share this with every member of the team. Uh, on the second grade team. I put in very specific information here, assignment, overview. Uh, I might be doing this, the teacher might be doing this, but we're working sort of collaboratively in this document. Again, I don't always have time to meet with the teachers. They certainly don't always have time to meet with me. And so if we can put a doc together, we can kind of get in there and work uh, when it's convenient for us. Uh, the teachers I was working on this one were, with were just hysterical because they happened to be at a Starbucks on a Saturday afternoon and I was on my couch at home. Um, and all of a sudden they opened the doc and they sent me a note saying, hey, you know, can you get in here? We're ready to work right now. And we did. And we probably spent, you know, 90 minutes on a Saturday afternoon building out some pieces of this particular collaboration document. But what you can see is that um, we try to capture um, all the ideas and artifacts that we might want to use in the process of teaching this particular lesson. And the exemplar that I showed them to do this project and you can kind of see there's commenting happening on the side when we're planning the doc, you know, doing in the document together, which is really great. We talk about exactly who's responsible for what, um, even what the students are responsible for, the librarian's responsible for. Here's a sample of the postcard. So what we decided to do is after the students would come in, get, they get background knowledge in the classroom, they come to me along with the teachers. They are present. They don't drop and go. Um, we were going to have them work through some research on modern Japan, very specific kind of guiding questions we were going to give them. And um, they were going to write a personal narrative based on that research. And that personal narrative was a, a postcard for, to home to mom and dad telling them about um, what they learned or saw in, on their visit to modern Japan. So that sample postcard is actually uh, created in Google Presentation. And we just did a little template for the student and then they access it through a template gallery, and then they're able to um, work in there and, and do their work. And we even um, find them Creative Commons imagery to use so that um, they can pop something in there that they know it's safe to use. So once the teachers see the exemplars, they get really excited, and that sort of is the hook for me. And, and I don't mind doing this. It's actually a lot of fun, and it takes me back to my marketing days, so it's, it's fine. It works great. And I'm going to try to see if I can get back to our slides. There we go. So all of these uh, that are listed here I believe are in the live binder and um, uh, Peggy's been working with me on make sure I get everything out there that I can and that it's publicly shared so you can see it all. But um, 
when you look at these collaboration docs, you're going to notice some are probably a little more um, complete than others, and that goes back to this idea of collaboration versus cooperation. Um, some teachers are still at the cooperation phase, and they're going to give me as much as they can or what they think they have time for in a collaboration doc, and others who are kind of at that full collaboration stage understand that what we're really doing is backwards designing lessons, and they really like that, and they kind of um, invest in it a little more. But um, each one of these sort of gives you a different flavor of, um, of what, we, what we can possibly create. Um, all right. So at the end of every project, <laughs> Uh, what I like to do is I like to assess um, how I did and how the teacher viewed that whole process. I really view the library as a small business operating inside of a much larger business. And I have customers. My customers are my students, my parents, teachers. And I want to know how I'm doing. Am I, am I delivering good customer service? So um, what I have done is created a collaboration survey, and at the end of the survey, at the end of a, of a collaboration, I send out the survey to teachers and I ask them to complete these for me. And uh, they give me feedback on how I've performed. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with Google Apps, um, you can make forms and then responses from the form go into a back-end spreadsheet. And that spreadsheet can be shared with anybody. So all that data I'm collecting about how I'm doing can be shared with anybody, and most importantly, I definitely share all of that information with my administrator. Uh, we don't always get time to meet and talk and kind of bring him up to speed on what's happening in the library, and so um, I make sure he knows exactly how I'm doing in the library uh, through peer reviews. So um, I, I share all that back-end information with them, and I'm going to try and show you what that survey looks like, so hang on a second. So this is the form that I send out to teachers at the conclusion of a collaboration. And they go through here and give me different, you know, um, different things. They, you know, they'll tell me somewhat satisfied, neutral, dissatisfied, very dissatisfied. And like I said, I take all of this information. It goes into a spreadsheet on the back end, and I, I share that with um, administrators. And, and more importantly, you know, I want to know how I'm doing. I want to make sure that I'm doing a good job for these guys. So uh, that's been a really important part of the process. And, and teachers were kind of hesitant at this at first because I think they felt like, well, you know, I don't want to hurt your feelings, and I don't want you to take this personally. And I assure them I don't take any of their feedback personally. This is completely professional. I want to improve the services um, and, and the, how I deal with them and how we work together, and that's what I'm using this information for, purely to improve what I do for them and make, you know, make me a better collaborative partner and, and, and plan with them. Hey, Peggy, I'm getting faster at this. You should be hugely impressed by that. <laughs> So the next slide is, um, the survey was really great, but I really wasn't getting a lot of granularity on exactly how the teachers um, perceived the lesson and how it kind of went over with students. I wanted to get a lot more feedback on how we were actually doing with these collaborations at that teaching and learning level. So um, one of the things that we do in the, in the corporate world, and it's pretty standard operating procedure, is to do a post-mortem on our projects where you know, after um, a client visit or you produced a product or you went to a trade show or, or anything, you know, you get the team back together to talk about what worked, what didn't, what would we change, what are the epiphanies that we had, um, and just get, you know, do that, have that reflection moment. Well, again, it's very hard for teachers to get together and, and do all this stuff in person, so I, I created a postmortem document and I invite all of the people who participated in the collaboration with me to come into that document and reflect on it and talk about what we can change, what we can do differently. It's turned into a really excellent way to brainstorm. Uh, it's also had a side effect of a place where we can gather up all the artifacts that the teacher created or I created or the student created for this project. Um, and I think that's hugely important for teachers because they're so busy and they create so much stuff that they don't think about um, how they're going to 
what, what is the repository going to be for all of this wonderful work they're doing? I mean, the reality is that teachers aren't going to stay at the same school forever and ever and ever. And they're going to go out and, you know, find a different job in a different school. And now they have portfolios that they can take with them and, and demonstrate to, you know, other people, you know, what they've been able to accomplish. So it's kind of had the side effect of creating these repositories uh, and artifacts for the teachers. I'm going to show you a postmortem. Let's see, where is the postmortem? Ah, here. So I showed you that Modern Japan collaboration document, and this is what the postmortem looked like on it. And it's just a series of questions, sort of prompts that I give the teachers to start thinking about. I usually kick it off. I'll start because um, I'm, I'm the one initiating this. So I start uh, with some reflections and talking about what I think worked well or didn't work well. I try to capture everything that the teachers did, um, even in their classroom. So these were these kind of KWL charts that teachers created for our Modern Day Japan project in their classrooms. And I went in and photographed them and put them in here. And you can see how te one teacher did it this way. Another teacher um, produced the charts a little differently. And then um, I talk about how we can consider doing some things differently next time, things we noticed the, the students might have been struggling with. I, I wasn't particularly keen on the graphic organizer that we used for note taking for that particular project, so I'm offering a different idea for next time. I also said that you know there might be need to be more sanity checks along the way um, with the students to make sure that um, kids are finding the information they need and we're really taking um, note of their note taking skills. Uh, you can see there are blank spots here where teachers some teachers didn't comment, but then you see Jay Lockwood put in quite a few comments. And she was actually sort of the, the other initiator on the project with me, so that's what I would anticipate. And now this year, when we're ready to do this project again, I'm going to look through these notes, they're going to look through these notes, and we're going to modify to see what we need to do to improve the experience, not only for the teachers, but also definitely for the students as well. And again, um, these are great because the teacher can um, put whatever artifacts they want in here, and this is something that can kind of travel with them, uh, so to speak, if they um, ever leave our school. So uh, there's a few postmortems on the live binder that you can take a look at uh, and, and you know, um, kind of see how those kind of work out. And again, these kind of run the gamut on that scale of, you know, cooperation to collaboration. Uh, there have been many postmortems where I'm the only one who talks, but that's okay because I have a record of what I might want to change for next time. And the teacher does definitely, they do appreciate that. Uh, this is uh, something else that we did. Um, we, I was starting to think about, well, uh, we were working with middle school students and they needed to um, kind of brush up on their note taking skills. So a few years ago we created these um, email card templates. Again, this is done in Google presentation. And you can create this, um, this note card um, template and then students can go and get it and copy it and make their own copy for their own um, Google Drive, which is where you keep uh, your Google documents. And uh, we we, we set this up because we really wanted to get a look at how students were taking their notes. So it was really great because once the middle schoolers started taking notes, they started sharing them with me. So I could see all of their different um, uh, slides in what was the equivalent of a, of a note deck, a slide deck that was just, you know, note cards. And um, it was really great because I, I vividly remember this. I was sitting in my house. It was probably 7 o'clock on a Sunday night. I was going through some note cards that some students had shared with me. I happened to be in a note card at the same time that this particular student was in her note card. And I remember looking at her, her content on the card and I, was, I, was, I sent her a comment and I said, you know, I don't really get what the relevance is of this particular piece of information you've taken down. I don't see how it ties in. It's kind of a weak note. And I gave her some ideas about how I might paraphrase it differently or change it. And within seconds of me making that comment, I could see her in there typing and changing it based on my tip for her. It was as if I was virtually sitting next to her. I was there at the point of need. She sees me in a different light than just the lady who can hand her a book. She sees me as the person who can actually help guide and direct her research and actually add some value to her process. And that was, I think, a really huge epiphany for me on the power of Google Apps. You know, I've seen it in other ways, but when you see it with a student, that's when it really, really hits you how really powerful it is. So, um, 
And I know there's a lot of stuff going through the chat, and like I said, I can't react to you right now because if I do, uh, I could already see that I'm about to go over our time limit, so I want to get through the presentation, and then I know that um, the uh, organizers here are going to give me some time to answer questions. Um, the other thing that I want to point out to you is that uh, sometimes you can't always have the luxury of doing that upstream, and you have to be okay with that, and you have to be ready for it, and you have to be flexible. So this is a rubric um, that was created by one of our history um, social studies teachers, and I actually think this teacher is in the room right now. If Katie G is still out there, I believe this was um, Katie G's document, but she came to me and she said, you know, I'm doing this current events thing, and I would love to get some tips in there. You know, what can you do? And I said, well, do you uh, have a rubric? And she did. It was a Google Doc. And she posts the Google Doc rubric to her website. And I said, well, if you can share it with me, I'll put some tips in there, but I'll do it through a comment versus embedding it inside the document. So if you look at this screen, you can see that I have a lot of comments out here on the side. And those are just me kind of chit-chatting with the student, giving them some tips on this particular um, rubric they had to use. So this was actually a really fast turn time project. It, it came up late, but you want to be agile. You want to be flexible. You want to build that rapport. You want to build those connections for the teacher. So you stop and you make time to do it, because you're probably, as a librarian, going to have a little more time than the teacher, possibly. So um, this was just kind of a fast one that we did. It was, it was really good. The other one I wanted to show you is, again, just embedding at the point of need. So I talked to you about A to Z research, and I showed you the LMC wiki, or, or candy jar. Um, the other one that um, was really kind of cool was uh, the science director came to me about, mm, I guess, about a year and a half ago and um, told me that they were going to start moving a lot of the STEM fair research that students do every year. And STEM fair is a really big thing at our school. And they wanted to sort of move some of that um, preliminary research part of the process more to being sort of homework. And could I put something together for these students that would help them uh, and be really assistive and kind of point of need for them. So I started to think about that, and I thought, well, I'm a really, I'm very much a big proponent of the big six problem solving methodology. You know, could I take that as a framework to build something for both students and parents to help them work through the, the process of putting the STEM fair topic together, doing the research, um, doing the synthesis and the evaluation and the whole process. And so what I created for them was the Big Six um, STEM Live Binder. So this actually right here is a Live Binder, and I'm going to show you what that looks like. And I have to say that um, I combine, frequently I combine tools. So there's a lot of Google apps that are embedded in the, big, um, big, the STEM Big Six Live Binder, but there are other tools in there as well. And oftentimes what I find is that Google Apps turns out to be a staging platform for a lot of the work students do that eventually gets published to another particular tool. So whether it's a Glogster or a Prezi or a Live Binder or you know, any of those other tools, we stage a lot of the work um, initially uh, in Google Apps and then move it over. And this one's loading really slow, so I'm going to try and put away some other things here. Maybe that'll give me a little more speed. I don't know. But this is also um, in the live binder for this presentation, so you can get to it. Um, let's think here for just a second. And I bounce back because I don't want to take up too much time, but I'll come back to this if we can. But it's definitely, there's a link to it in the live binder for this session so you can see. It's a really rich um, uh, kind of component or product uh, with lots of stuff in there. And again, it's that one-stop shopping. It's designed both for students and parents. Okay. Uh, so we'll take a look at that if I have time at the end here. Uh, again, embedding upstream has been a really huge thing for me, and this was actually a collaboration that we're working on right now. I'm working with all language arts teachers in middle school. There are three of them, and I'm rolling through about, I want to say like 12 classes over the course of about four or five visits to talk about um, how we're going to teach them how to build works cited pages in EasyBib. And um, this is a piece of that particular collaboration document. And like I said, as teachers have learned this process of the collaboration document, 
um, they've actually kicked it up a notch and are adding a lot more to these documents. Um, they're being very, very good about the learning objectives, putting those standards in there. This teacher even went to the extent of putting the common core standards in there, which is something new. So they're really taking to heart the sort of design process and, uh, and they've kind of adopted this collaboration doc as sort of their blueprint for lesson planning and they just kind of automatically share them with me now, which has been, it's been really fantastic and it is that, it is that, you know, moment of being embedded upstream where you kind of figure out it's all sort of coming together for you so it's really paying off. So, my advice to you, <laughs> be entrepreneurial. Um, you know, we get a lot of job descriptions for librarians and, and frankly, what I have found is that um, I don't, my job description changes almost every day depending on what the need is. That's what I want. I want to be there for them when they need it in, in whatever form I can provide it, uh, uh, keeping in mind my subject matter expertise areas. So, you know, I find I'm a pitch fan a lot of the time. I'm pitching ideas. I'm not only pitching ideas for me now, I'm pitching ideas for other teachers. Um, a lot of our specialist teachers are seeing what I'm able to accomplish and they would like very much to have more collaboration with those classroom teachers so they're, they're taking that um, curriculum and they're, you know, it's not just science in the science lab but how can we get science into the classroom as well. So uh, the other day the science teacher, uh, one of the science specialist teachers came to me and she said, you know, I have an idea for something. I would really like to work with the third graders, third grade teachers, but I keep saying let's collaborate, but they don't respond. And I said, well, what idea have you given them? And she said, well, I didn't really give them an idea, I just said I want to work with them. And I said, that's not enough. You really have to come up with an idea. You have to pitch something to them. They don't have the time to think about what that integration could look like. So um, I gave her an idea to go pitch to third grade. So, you know, seeing, kind of putting myself as this, um, seeing my, people are now seeing me as a sort of person who's figured out collaboration, so now they're coming to me and asking me how they can get it going. And again, collaboration will look different for everyone. It may not look the same for that science teacher or that um, tech teacher or the music teacher. And um, I think it's just really about coming up with some really great ideas. That's what's really important. So the, the last thing I, one of the last things I wanted to show you here was um, the FSA portfolio showcase. So I got kind of frustrated over time because we were doing really cool projects and teachers would maybe put them on their website or, um, and, and then they would change their website every year and they kind of blow away whatever project we did and I thought, well, let's get this somewhere. Let's put this all in one place if we possibly can. So I created this FSA portfolio showcase and this is really, this is just a wiki and I'm going to show you what it looks like. And the page that I'm going to take you to is actually the page um, that we put up uh, a particular project. So you can see that every grade over here has a, a link to the projects that they've done. These are all collaborations that have had, um, had my involvement in some way. Uh, this one actually was a second grade project where they were studying the Mighty Twelve Olympians. And what we decided is that this would be a great opportunity to introduce students to the Super 3 research process, which is a, a, a little kid version of the Big Six problem solving methodology. And we did a lot of research on the Olympian gods and um, we thought, wouldn't it be cool if they could create a Facebook page for their god? So what they did was um, we did these all in Google presentation and here you can see that the teacher created her own Google presentation. It's just a slideshow of the student's work. But it's a way for the students to demonstrate mastery of their topic in, I think, a really fun way. So I'm going to click through here. You can see the teacher has given um, some background on the project. And then you can start to see the pages. So I created the template for the Facebook page and we made one for every one of the gods the students were going to cover and then the students actually learned, and these are second graders, mind you, learned how to go into Google go in and get this template, save it, name it, share it with their teacher, and then start the editing process on it. Um, so, you know, we have one for every fourth, every second grade teacher did this with me, so they each created their own thing, and we put it out here for the world to see, which I cannot tell you how motivational that is to students. And then we went one step further. You know, I don't want parents to see these projects and think, wow, well, that was a gimmick or that was a tool and wasn't that cool, but um, you can see that there are, Standards here, we list all the standards that the student meets, both research, ASL, NETS-S, and we even have Google applications 
for grade level skills. So we're actually documenting what that grade level can do at a Google Apps level. So um, this is also on the live binder and you can take a look at it. And I feel like I'm way over time here, so I'm going to wrap up really fast and give people a chance to ask me questions. I just have a lot to share and I'm just so excited about sharing. <laughs> I want to tell everybody everything. So <clears throat> the future, I'm thinking of a lot of different things. Um, I've got all kinds of stuff on my plate. We're doing things like um, I'm going to start doing some Google Hangouts for students to offer them kind of office hours assistance, especially at that STEM fair time. Um, the Google Apps specialist and I are about to launch a really big parent training session on Google Apps. We're calling it Novice to Ninja. And um, we're also, I'm building an app right now with a student at school. Um, shout out to Matthew Tedda who's helping me build an app for the library so we can get some of this um, LMC Wiki and, and some of these databases onto, student, onto parents' devices and student devices so that they can get really quick access to point of need help. Uh, we're also looking at possibly uh, publishing student work under the Flagstaff brand and becoming our own little publishing house, which I think would be really fascinating to try and do. And thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm going to wrap up because um, I'm way over. <laughs> I'm going to turn off the talk button or Peggy's going to tell me what to do next. <laughs> thank you, Zoe. Um, I do have some questions that I captured throughout the, the chat. and. I think I think we'll start with those questions and then we'll do the show wrap up. Um, there aren't that many of them. Um, okay. In order to use Google Apps for education, you do your school actually has to have a domain, right? Or is there another way to use Google Apps? Yeah, so to become a Google Apps for Education School, you actually have to go in and, and register your domain and go through that process and, and, and set that, that all up to then Google. by itself um, provides email addresses, Google email addresses for all the students, right? So that's how they access the resources, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so at our school we have a domain that's for the teachers and we have a domain for students. So once you go in through the process of setting it all up, you're given the choice of creating you know, different domains. And then for us it's fsastudents.org is what the students use and all their Gmail addresses are tied to that domain. All the teachers' addresses are tied to the flagstaffacademy.org domain. So yeah, and um, you know, I could, we could put a link on the live binder that would uh, direct people on how to get more information about setting that up. Someone asked, is the upstream steps you were talking about, is that throughout the entire research process? Um, hmm, I'm not sure if I understand the question. Um, you mean, when I talk about upstream, I'm talking about me upstream as a planning process. Okay. So it's about how do you get you as the teacher librarian or, or whoever's involved in this process, how do you get in at the ground floor of the process? And a lot of times I do use research strategy as my way to, to sort of entice teachers to get me involved. You know, I'm the expert on that, so let me sit down with you early on and talk about how we can infuse your lesson with research strategies. Okay. I think this question has something to do with the post-project survey that you have. Do you have a way for people to put in requests or ask questions so you can research if you don't know right then and there, a box, an online place, a uh, form, how do you field questions, I guess. Um, you mean on the, collab that on, the, on the collaboration survey? I think yeah. so. I, that's where the question came up. Um, I think what happens is the collaboration survey is kind of set, but then in the post-mortem doc, we give people mm -hmm. lots of opportunities to talk. And there, I thought on the collaboration survey, I don't have it open in front of me right now, but I think there's a comment button or something. So a lot of times um, I do get comments on the back end on that spreadsheet about, you know, you know, what they, you know, any questions or especially if they want to, you know, say something specifically to me like, you know, I wish we had done X instead of Y or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I know within Google surveys you can you can ask. Questions. Oh yeah, there's definitely there's a um, comment field. Right, right. Somebody said that they loved using Prezi. Do you use Prezi in the presentation? Yeah, um, we give students a chance to definitely use Prezi. Um, I use Prezi a lot, especially when I'm in the when I'm teaching in the in the library. Most of my um, presentations are definitely in Prezi. I tend to use Google Presentation for the younger kids, and then Prezi for the older kids. Mm. Okay. 
those were the questions that I captured. I don't know if anybody else would like to ask Zoe a question. Um, you can either type in the chat. Have you ever used voice? Yeah, I've got the chat box open. Yeah, we use VoiceThread all the time. In fact, I think one of the links we put on the live binder was to a really big collaboration we did between middle school and first grade, um, where it was a poetry collaboration. And we produced the final product completely in VoiceThread. Hmm. And right after that, there are two other questions. Uh, what are some Google apps that can be used for technical vocational education? Hmm. Can that person be more specific? <laughs> Wayne, Wayne, can you be more specific than that? Do you want to get on the mic? Oh, a career in technical education. Um, hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I could see using Google Apps for that. I guess I would need to think about what specifically was the objective that you wanted to achieve, um, because that's kind of broad. So, you know, I kind of always push back and say, you know, what is it that, what is your learning objective? What do you want to achieve? And then we can talk about how Google would actually fit into all that. But, um, I mean, Google's so robust, it can be, I mean, I was creating Facebook pages with it. I mean, who would have ever thought that was possible? So, I, I think it's really, really, really um, versatile. And right after that, have you ever had a full class collaborate on a Google presentation? Yeah, actually, um, I have, and I know other teachers have as well. So um, you know, each do, you know, a class will be uh, maybe working in teams or pairs, but they'll add their own slides. And uh, the great thing about Google Apps is um, the tremendous amount of peer review and editing that can take place simultaneously. So yeah, we we, we see a lot of that. Very good. Those were the questions that that, yeah, they're simulated Facebook pages if they're in Google Docs, Carolyn, yes. Um, those were the questions. Oh, Wayne, did you still want to get on the mic? We didn't give you the mic yet. That's, that's why you can't get on it right now. Now you should be able to. Oh, OK. So those were the questions. I'm going to go okay. ahead and... and Close out, close out the show. Um, there are events coming up with the um, future of education. Um, Steve Hargadon's interviews on Tuesday, October first. He'll be talking with Will Richardson on Tuesday, October eighth, with Yovel Badash on Tuesday, the twenty second. Lenore Skinaski. And on Tuesday the 29th, Brandon Boosted. And those are all upcoming events. Upcoming shows for Classroom 2.live. 2.0 Live are here October 5th. That is the preview of the K-12 online conference with the organizers. There are no shows the 12th or the 19th for other events. And the 26th of October, the featured teachers yet to be announced. Connected Educators Month is the month of October, so there are a lot of ways to connect with other educators, like the Reform Symposium and the um, Library 2.013 Worldwide Virtual Conference in October. Here's the Connected Educators web page for um, Connected Educators Month. And within the survey that will come up as you exit the room, you'll find a place to nominate a featured teacher or this particular survey. It used to be in there. Uh, this particular survey, you can actually nominate a teacher to be uh, the guest presenter here at Classroom 2.0 Live. That's at tinyurl.com slash CR2OLive featured teacher nominate, but without the E at the end. And I mentioned the survey. Uh, this will open up as you exit the classroom, as you leave the presentation. Or if it doesn't open, um, there's a link, or will be soon, in the chat box or the, the log of the recording 
and there's always the link to the survey to uh, request a, a PD certificate in the live binder. And this is what the survey looks like. As far as the featured teacher goes, you can nominate a colleague or you can also nominate yourself uh, to be the featured teacher each month. And I mentioned the survey. Uh, as far as the uh, other resources available, the Classroom 2.0 recordings are at iTunes U. There's a video collection as well as an audio collection that you can access. Here is the page that, that shows the Classroom 2.0 site and one of those resources is an RSS feed of the show archives. So there's all sorts of, of ways to access old shows. So we'd like to thank Jo Midler for her uh, presentation today. Uh, Steve Hargadon, who's the founder of Classroom 2.0, Teacher 2.0, Future of Education, and Web 2.0 Labs Project. We'd like to thank Weebly for providing the website and everyone here who has participated in the show, and as well as um, Blackboard Collaborate for providing the, the classroom. Thank you all for coming.